Hey guys, thank you all for coming today. Is it live now? Yep. Yep. Wow. Okay. Um, it's okay if you cut me off as my like, uh, like camera shy. No, you don't have to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you all for coming today. Uh, we have a few familiar faces, some of our students, and we have um, some potential applicants uh, for the next batch of boot camps. Uh, we have a familiar rain card is one of our partners as well. So uh, thank you all for coming again. I'm Weipin. I'm the program manager for Alphacan Singapore. And um, so you must be wondering what Alphacan does. We are a tech uh, and startup school. Okay, so we offer um, full-time bootcamp and part of courses um, for um, aspiring developers as well as uh, digital marketers and uh, product designers. Okay, so now, um, so today, we're very privileged to have uh, three of the top most Singapore's most established developers here. Okay, and um, I think without further ado, let's just, you know, uh, we'll, we'll go around, you have a mic, you can just go around to introduce yourself. Um, all of you, you know, probably would have, um, you know, seen them, they are probably not uh, very new faces in the uh, tech community. But let's hear, let's hear more about their stories today and uh, what they have to say when it comes to um, the, the, their own software development journey. Okay, um, first, so. Um, hello everyone, my name is uh, So. Currently I'm working at Singapore Power uh, in the fiber state as well. I joined uh, Singapore Power about six months ago. Um, so this is a new department new team uh, that we've started. And, uh, I was the first employee of this new department. Uh, I have been joining Singapore Power. I, did, uh, I was working with KPAP, um, so I was leading the mobile team there. Um, and then I've been uh, involved in the iOS community for the last five years. Um, I also organized the iOS conference in Singapore. It's known as iOS Con SG. And uh, if you come to the meetup group, you'll probably see me every now and then. Hi, my name is Ted. Uh, I'm a former high school teacher and currently technical director at uh, a local rails agency called Tinkerbox. Uh, I'm also involved in the local Ruby community, organizing the monthly meetups, the Rails Girls meetups, and uh, Red Hot Ruby conference next year. Hi, uh, my name is Michael. I run the Singapore PhD user group. Uh, I've been running doing that for about the last 10 years. Uh, two years ago, I, last year, I organized the first PhD conference in Asia, uh, which was attended by, by quite a lot of people uh, from across Asia. And the creator of PhD came down to Singapore, which is kind of like pretty cool. Um, uh, currently, I also run a website called engineers.sg. So basically, it's a site where we curate or we will go and record uh, tech, uh, technology meetups in Singapore. Uh, I'm also working at Singapore Power. I just joined, I joined in August. Previously, I was working at Pivotal Labs. So, yeah, so just be. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, so, all three of you actually run their own meetups and conferences. Um, so, iOS Conf last year, um, a few months ago, right? It was actually organized by you, yeah. Sue. And then you were, you know, you're also super busy. Like the last time I communicated with you, you were in Taiwan for Ruby Conf and then PHP as well. Um, yeah, so so uh, I think you guys, you know, whenever you're in the community or um, budding, budding, you know, developers, you should um, totally you know, join all those meetups and sessions um, to get more insights from them and um, talk to them. Um, yeah, and to share more insights. Now, before, now, um, so this, this whole session, right, is actually break, um, broken up into several parts. Okay, so just now, you know, you have actually heard from them, their introduction. Now, we, this session is also catered to our current batch of students as well. So, um, some of the questions that they have raised, and I've actually collated some of them, uh, will be pretty useful to you, especially some of you who will embark on um, your journey, um, you know, learning development, web development and iOS development. So, um, so we will just go around. Okay, um, first question actually is about on learning. This section is always about us, about learning. So maybe, you know, we can start with Sue. Can you share with us on your software development learning journey? Um, yeah, so uh, I 
I mean, uh, it's quite an interesting story for many of you who are starting uh, programming uh, through this course or uh, you're going to learn from bootcamp. Um, so, like these days, I see kids like eight years old, twelve years old, um, learning programming. They have apps on App Store. But I, I started pretty late. Um, I started when I was uh, when I joined my engineering uh, graduation. Uh, so about, um, when I was uh, 17 or 18 years old. Um, so, but then for four years in uh, in the college, the languages that I learned um, gave me the foundation of uh, programming. But then the things that I had to apply in work are very different than what I learned, what I, uh, learned in um, college or in my um, degree. Um, so a lot of what I learned um, is through projects, is uh, by contributing to open source community, and then um, by speaking to many and many people uh, within my organization and also outside my organization. Um, so that, that is why when I mentioned like uh, we are part of a middle um, group, we are part of a community. Um, so that kind of encourages you to um, also come to these events. Uh, not only just you know you might not know everything. Um, whatever is being said at the meetups, but there will be people who will be able to help you, who will be willing to um, speak to you and uh, guide you, mentor you. And um, so uh, basically these events and these people are going to uh, really help you through your journey. Uh, so yeah. Thanks, Sue. Now, um, I understand that from three of you, only Sue has some um, more, more formal training in computer science in your four years degree, right? Um, so, Ted, you actually self-taught your way through uh, for programming. Can you really share with us on your, your own personal journey? Yes, so, so my background is, is quite different. I, as you said, I never took any CS classes in my life so far. Uh, it actually started when I was uh, very young, I was 12 years old. Uh, there was a Swedish proto community called Skank that allow you to use HTML and CSS and JavaScript to build your own uh, profile page on the community. And this got me interested uh, in it in the first place. And uh, I kept pursuing it as a pastime for the next 10 years or so, but I never really considered it as a career option. Uh, I remember when I finished high school, uh, I considered different options for uni and uh, the thing I can remember is my, my criteria was at least nothing that has anything to do with computers. Um, but then I, I was a high school teacher for a while. Uh, I dropped out of uni, and that's when my friends pointed out to me that uh, you know you're already pretty good at programming, so you can uh, go live abroad and like, be a programmer forever. Uh, which, which took me out of Sweden about uh, six years ago. Now I've been in Singapore for three years. Hello, Michael. Well, I, I majored in history and political science, so I did not study computer science, but I studied history and um, economics, even I studied economics, so I was always been a arts and social science kind of person. Uh, what got me interested in computers was I think the internet. So the back when I first got exposed to computers in 96, I think, 95 or 96. So basically, there was uh, start the internet and um, I was interested in it. Uh, my dad got me a computer. Uh, it's a Pentium 133 with a 28 or 8K BPS modem. So that like, right, I need to get online. So I went online. Uh, I went and rather I got myself an internet account with Cyberway. Anyone here knows what that is? Never mind. Uh, <laughs> exposing my age. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I got online and the uh, first thing I did was I go find out how how to. Uh, download stuff, it was using Windows 95, went online, found like front page, how to download front page, and it's like, how do you upload your... So basically I found a, before that I actually read a book, a small little book on, on, on the internet, um, and it was quite a lot of, it was written by Singaporean, ironically, so how, how you can get online and all that stuff, so from there I, I read through it, and I'm like, hey, it's interesting, what is FTP, what is uh, World Wide Web, and uh, HTML, it's like, oh, there's a very nice tool where you create my whole home page and everything. Uh, and it got, that got me interested in web design. And then from web designing, I 
started working uh, on other people's code. Uh, see, I looked at other people's code and uh, I kind of like, I challenge the, the technology because I know what technology can do. And my natural curiosity just brought me in deeper into it and say, how, is, how does this form work? How do I log into this, this website? All that question just draw me deeper and deeper into that, that, uh, that rabbit hole and then from there, just one thing led to another. I learned PHP, I learned Ruby, I learned Objective-C and now I'm learning Go. So yeah, it's a very interesting journey. So you are a geek since young, so why don't make you, you know, choose history? I like history. <laughs> ah, okay. I, I kind of like when, when, my, when I was in secondary school, I was like, okay, I need to pick a major. I was looking at my history results and my geography results. And I was like, I think my history results are a little bit better. I got more A's there. They have no more history. <laughs> Is there any relevance? Uh, I think it gives me a bit more creative thinking in how I approach the problem. Um, yeah, of course, the added bonus is when we have uh, foreign dignitaries in Singapore. <laughs> I give them a historical tour of Singapore. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Okay, um, and then, you know, um, recounting back the early years when you guys actually first started learning coding, um, have you actually hit the roadblock and decided to speak? Uh, well, um, obviously, um, there will be so many uh, problems while learning is how you overcome um, those problems, right? Um, so, um, back to you know, um, my college days, when I first uh, uh, you know, started learning the programming language, um, I didn't have a computer at that time, because like, uh, my dad uh, had a computer for me. Um, so, I mean, uh, I was really interested in programming, and um, so I used to go to the lab, um, the computer lab, um, and uh, the lab gets closed at a certain time in the evening, so I had to request a uh, special permission uh, to stay late. And uh, usually when you ask uh, help to people, um, uh, if you're really interested, people will help you. So, uh, you know, I, I uh, went to the college director and I expressed my interest and he was very supportive about that. And he let me use the um, uh, lab beyond the time it was uh, supposed to open. That's how I like, learned. So, um, I, as I mentioned, I, I didn't have a personal computer that time when I was uh, learning programming. Okay, finding all ways to uh, reach out to one. Okay, what about you, Ted? Right, so when I was 12, that was about 1998. Okay, so we're not aged, okay? Yes, can you please have to reverse engineer on age? Stack Overflow didn't exist. Uh, YouTube did not exist, and online tutorials was totally not a thing. So the learning process was uh, very, very slow compared to what it would be today. I remember going to the, to the library in a neighboring town to, to borrow a book on, on JavaScript. So it's the old school kind of book that is made from, from trees. And we just take it home and, and type the books in from the book into my computer and, and see how it worked out. Um, but there were a lot of these roadblocks, and at the time you didn't really know where to, to go for help. So the strategy was more to leave that problem for later and work on something else, and then come back when you uh, had learned more. Um, but since, since I did this for fun, uh, I think this never uh, made me think that I should stop doing programming because I still enjoy it a lot. So, yeah, asking for help is, is actually very important. No matter where you are, even online. Uh, back when I first started learning some simple programming, um, I, when I ran into issues, first thing I went to was before days of Stack Overflow and all that. Right? So, what, back in the day, there's this thing called news groups. Ever heard anyone heard of news groups? Yeah. So online news groups, there will be kind of like chat rooms, or more email threads, there are forums, online forums. And uh, I would download all the threads and uh, I would go in and ask questions. I remember one time I was writing a, a script in Lotus for Lotus Notes. 
uh, there was a lot of source and small application. I was trying to figure out how to, how to calculate range, like from uh, one date to another date, how many days actually transpired between these two dates. I was uh, trying to figure out how to actually calculate that. I couldn't figure that out. Um, so I went on this new script and said, hey, uh, guys, I'm telling you, how do you do this? And uh, the people who were there were very helpful. They gave a lot of tips and ideas. Um, so that's pretty much, don't be shy just to ask questions because if you have the kind of questions, chances are out there there's somebody else who has the same questions as you. And uh, they probably someone else do further down the road that has the answers and probably they can help you. Sometimes I'm learning how to phrase a question uh, helps, helps uh, others give you a better answer or more directed answer. So keywords, find the right keywords to ask for. Um, even recently, I was writing some interesting code in Swift 3. Um, it was a really interesting, well, for me it was like, look, it's just a hash, right? How, how hard can this be? I banged my head against the wall a few times trying to figure out how do I, this, how do I you know, get the value from a hash coming from push notification. And I was like, oh, this is crazy. I was like, okay, no, I can't fix this. I went out and looked for one of my other colleagues, Her Will. It was a junior developer. She came in and kind of like looked at me and said, this is how you do it. And she was like, okay. Uh, for me, it was like, I have always, there's always something new to learn. Even as a senior developer like myself, there's so many things I can learn from, from, from juniors. Uh, because they are always have a fresh perspective on things, which I think is very important. Yeah. Okay. So, do you think you um, know, learn anything differently from your fellow developers or peers? Um, now looking back, that you think actually matters. Maybe you know getting a mentor. I'm not sure. Like back uh, then when you first started. When I first started, like okay, so, uh, the company I used to work for <coughs> is on uh, new innovation, mm -hmm. and they're really big on pair programming. Uh, uh, guys, know what programming is? Yeah. So. Um, at the point, I was thinking, thinking of a career change, moving from one job to another. And I was, in my consideration for the job, I was like, I need to find a place where they're very nurturing and they really teach you uh, stuff that you can that mix. So I joined a company with zero Ruby on Rails experience, uh, zero experience. I, I, have some, I have years of experience with PHP and some of Objective C. Um, the company took a chance on me and, 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 and basically it mentored me. He was a senior developer, pair of media, very big on pair programming. So we work on a project together and you basically learn uh, the stuff from a senior developer sitting next to you and he'll tell you what to do. Uh, I remember when I first learned uh, Objective-C with Mugun Kuma. I remember I was staring at the screen for three months, not touching anything. We were pair programming, right? But he was doing all the coding, I was just staring at the screen. Oh, this is how, how you do a dictionary. Oh, this is how you do that. So it was quite fun. Uh. But then again, got, I got I started to work. But that, that after a while, it gets very frustrating. I want to write some code, right? So you just want to get out there and write some code. Um, having a mentor and someone to help you along, I think, is finding somebody who can help you with that. I think it's very important. What about that? I think I'm ready to say that everything that matters, I learned from my fellow programmers. So. Uh, Working with programming for fun and on my own for a very long time uh, made me good at the, the, the basics like reading code and framing problems properly. Uh, but getting put into a team has taught me uh, a lot more about uh, being disciplined and uh, writing code that is well structured and maintainable that can be read and understood easily by other people. And uh, I think that's much more valuable than all the things that I learned on my own before that. Yeah, I think uh, for, for me, uh, for all these years, uh, I've learned so many things from my, my uh, you know, friends, my colleagues. Um, but even recently, like, we do uh, code reviews on a regular basis uh, for whatever features we work. And irrespective of how experienced a uh, reviewer is, uh, you always get a different um, kind of perspective uh, from your colleagues um, on how to code, how to think about a problem differently, and making sure uh, you, know, uh, you, you think about something that you uh, never thought uh, about when you started um, solving this problem. 
Um, and as, as Michael mentioned, it's always important to have some uh, mentors um, from whom we can learn. So one example I can give is like a, a right after from the college, I, I joined uh, this company called uh, Red Hat. So it's basically a Linux company, and um, they have you know uh, the distributed Linux operating system. Um, so I, I was really happy in that job. I was very comfortable after working there for a couple of years. And um, then this uh, opportunity came uh, in a startup uh, where I had a chance to pick up a new programming language. And at that time, you know, Ruby on Rails was just getting popular, and uh, I had a chance to pick up that. But I was not really sure you know, whether I should leave an uh, established company like uh, React and um, join a startup. And at that time, I had a mentor who, who was a um, colleague also in the company. And he, you know, I asked him, and, uh, Ask for suggestion. Also, you know, sometimes you can ask also um, senior colleagues for a career advice and what path you can follow in your career and what's best for you. So he, he told me that you know, if you really want to um, go beyond your comfort zone and you want to learn something new, you know, you should work for a startup at least for a few years in your in your life so that you know you get to do a lot of things within a short period of time and you get to learn. A lot of things. Um, so I, I took his advice and I, I joined the um, service. So I worked on Ruby on Rails for a few years, which uh, also um, really I kind of uh, worked for a MIT Media Labs to startup um, through which I kind of started my um, journey with iOS programming. Um, and that time, uh, iOS was pretty new, I think, back in 2008, there was uh, no literary. Tutorials available, no, uh, not a lot of books available. But I was, I was very lucky to uh, work with that um, startup because uh, the founders were from Media Labs, and then they had um, you know friends from Stanford. So the early Stanford lectures that you know um, currently is available on iTunes, but that time um, it was not available online. So I had access to uh, the resources from you know the early days. And I, I got to learn a lot of things. But then again, coming back to the point, uh, you, you always have opportunity to uh, learn from your uh, colleagues and uh, mentors, uh, irrespective of you know where you work. So it's always important to keep an open mind and learn from uh, learn from everybody. Got it. Thanks, Sue. So if I may summarize, it, it is um, being fearless to join a startup and to learn. You know, you probably learn most of the things from a startup. And uh, be thick skin, even though you're a senior developer, to be open enough to learn from um, the juniors as well as um, the community. All right, um, thanks, guys. So, um, so last question on learning: How do you keep up the changing trends um, with regards to web development and uh, iOS development? So, where should we start? Like our to our students who just you know who are going to graduate next week, um, where should they start? So it again depends on um, the label you are currently in. You know, if you are really in the advanced level, why you always might look for what's new, what's uh, upcoming, what's changing, and there are a few sources for that. You know, first of all, you need to know who are the really uh, popular developers in your own domain, whether it's web or iOS. You need to have access to Twitter. The Twitter is basically where you can kind of get to know about this guy. It's Twitter, GitHub. Um, and then uh, you need to follow these people and then keep, you know, at least checking their tweets. Even if you don't do it personally, you need to see what these people are talking about. And, and then sometimes they'll post a link, sometimes they'll talk about something uh, that might sound like a jargon to you, but then just do a research on, on things that they're talking about. Um, this is a lot of tutorials available on YouTube that are like indie developers starting their own YouTube channels. Uh, and getting really popular and uh, having millions of views on the individual channels. So that is another source that you can learn from the, the YouTube reviews. Um, and also uh, making sure of you understand uh, whatever your uh, popular uh, you know, open source library uh, is, uh, making sure you follow those libraries and uh, read the code, uh, read the code from those libraries and then uh, try to uh, try to understand uh, how it's been structured, um, not only really just on some part of it, but overall how, what is the architecture of uh, these libraries or these applications. So, um, 
and basically the meetups also and then events also give me an opportunity to kind of uh, meet other people and then uh, uh, you know get to know about uh, what's upcoming and uh, what is the latest trend and what is the latest tool that other people are using in the community and then so we'll be using that on our so guys, you know what to do before that is. Ted. Alright, so the, the trends tend to move uh, very fast, uh, which is especially true of some, some communities. So I think my, my tip was, would be to uh, keep an eye on it. Uh, when something new pops up, uh, conclude that it's there, uh, read up of it, and summarize in a few sentences what makes it different from things that are already out there. Um, but also focus on, on mastering one, one framework first so that you have like your home base that you're comfortable with and proficient with so that you can uh, actually deliver a whole application using that. And after that, I think it's, it's a bit of a lottery sometimes. Uh, so my recommendation would just be if you're picking up a second language or a second uh, framework, Pick something that you enjoy working with because uh, that is going to make you want to spend more time with it, which is going to make you better, which is going to make you enjoy it more. And once you have connected that loop, then uh, everything becomes much, much easier. Mm, yeah, I, I agree with all the other suggestions. Read tweets, free blogs, watch videos. Uh, go for meetups. So a lot of meetups out there. You can then go for, to, to check out video.sg. There's a there's a web a website that gives you all the lists of events that happening in town. Go check them out. Uh, go for his meetups. Go for Ruby meetup and come for the PHP meetup. <laughs> so cool. Uh, another thing you could do beyond just reading uh, blogs and reading about other things, uh, all the cool things. But what question? Question yourself, what makes it so cool? And stop just reading and start writing code. Basically jump, jump to the event. If you say this, yarn is cool. Has anyone tried yarn? NPM, yarn, and the competitor to NPM. Right, everyone says it's cool, but how do you mean it's cool? Have you actually tried it? Go try it out. Installation for those are very simple. I think you're online for all this information there. It's also a reminder to myself that, you know, deep, jump the demand of the pool. Um, jump the demand of the pool and question and basically challenge the, challenge the technology. I remember the first website I ever built, um, I didn't know much about um, on, online animation, like how do you do animation and stuff, right? So I, I went on my first freelance project, uh, it was for a bridal studio. And they were like, oh, well, you want some very nice uh, videos, it was some like photo gallery of their of all the uh, you know, all their nice bridal gowns and all that stuff, right? So I was thinking to myself, what is the best way to display these gowns? And I was like looking around and a friend told me about this uh, cool animation engine called uh, Splash, uh, which eventually it was bought by a company called Macromedia that became Macromedia Flash, which then got bought by Adobe and now it's called something else. Anyway, so that was back in 2000, no, it was maybe on that. So anyway, yeah, I didn't know anything about Flash uh, animation, so I, I, did, I downloaded the app, uh, found the tutorial online, went through it, and I was like, okay, I think I can do a nice launch, like intro, splash, page, animation with uh, Flash. I was like, okay, let's try this. Um, I knew nothing about it, but I told myself, technology is not going to be that hard, right? Just do it. Just write it out, look at the code. Scan files, uh, scan images, throw it all in, and this timeline animation, da da da. Um, not much programming involved, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's about just daring to try something. Don't just sit there and read and enjoy the enjoy the flowery words flowing your way, but actually write some code, contribute back also. Yeah. And if I'd like to add, um, you know, if you're not available or not free or meetup based, you can always check out Engineers or Yeah. Um, so, okay, so thank you all. Um, basically, this is, this is the um, bulk of it uh, where we actually get most of the questions on jobs and opportunities. 
Now, um, so on questions on okay, learning aside, after I've actually um, you know graduated from a boot camp or you have actually self taught yourself at a certain level, now you, um, you know as a student they will actually uh, be seeking for opportunities to get experience. Um, so where should they start? Should it be from internships? Or should they, you know, take up uh, freelance projects from maybe Momo Central and so on and so forth? Where do you think should be the starting point and, you know, any advice for them? I think getting uh, into a real project uh, gives you a lot of experience. So whether it's an internship or freelance, uh, freelance project, it doesn't really matter. Um, but it is also important to work in a team. Uh, you can uh, work alone and uh, you can learn a lot of things. Uh, um, but while you're starting, especially, it's very important you find somebody uh, who is quite slightly uh, more senior than you, or even if you pair up with somebody of, of the same experience level, you have a team and they kind of challenge each other and you learn together something. Uh, if you do it alone, whether it's a freelancing project or intensity, there's so many um, ways you can do a thing uh, you know, wrong. It's, Nothing bad about it, but then you, at some point of time, you need to uh, rethink and correct yourself. So that is why, um, as opposed to freelance project, I would say if you find an intensive uh, in any organization uh, locally, that is a uh, better um, you know option. Uh, in my opinion, I don't know what they feel, but uh, this is my take. Uh, all right. So so there will always be uh, freelance projects because uh, not all projects are large enough to be profitable for, for agencies. Um, but I would probably be careful in taking up freelance projects as the, the first thing uh, after learning a new uh, skill. Uh, partly because you, in a way, you're alone, so you don't really have people to ask, but mostly because uh, pretty quickly your, your goal is going to shift from uh, learning more into so about more of self-preservation, so I need to finish this project and I just need to make it work, which uh, easily leads to cutting out of corners and, and uh, by doing that, enforcing uh, bad habits as well. So uh, I definitely think uh, freelancing is a, a great option, but probably after uh, one or two years of working uh, on a team. I thought you were going to say internet in a box. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, after one or two years of interning. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think the walls go in the pretty cool. Uh, I, actually, I would say, uh, well, I'll just relate my first my experience as a developer. For many years, I was I was writing code on my own. I said I was writing my own. Uh, I was doing my own freelance work. I said I was doing I was doing web hosting. I was doing, I was managing servers, I was learning how to do web design, I was learning how to do PHP coding and other stuff. So I think part of the, I think back in the day when the internet was young, it was easier to just be one man and do everything yourself. Um, but after doing that for like four years, I thought it was, I, I got really burnt out. Um, I learned a lot, I've done, I've done a lot, i tried a lot of different things, which on hindsight, it was a good thing. When I joined a, uh, a startup, uh, I, my skills in being able to do front end, back end, and manage servers was quite uh, crucial. Because in a startup, they want somebody who is all rounded, who can do front end, back end, and do everything, you know, everything that they, they need to do. Um, so, as an independent developer myself doing freelance work, I was left around on devices, I could do everything on my own. Uh, I was able to do a lot of things, uh, learn a lot of things. And I think nowadays with a lot of online resources, you can learn up, learn something and ramp up really quickly on anything new. Last time when I looked, uh, there were a website that was really helpful, like things like howtoforge.com, which shows me how to set up my own servers and other stuff. Skills that you may not actually need now, because with things like Heroku and all that, you don't actually need to learn how to build your own servers anymore. But even then, it's pretty cool to know what such things are. Freelancing is good, it gives you the opportunity to try everything on your own. Um, but after a while, you do need to find people to work with. Because, you know, all these things, I, when I was doing very long business, I heard everyone talk about, oh, all these, you should do the agile methodology, you can do agile, right? Agile, man. I was like, I think to myself, I'm a one man, how agile can I get? 
<laughs> I can't be agile as a one, one man show, right? There's no way I can be agile. Well, I can write tests, but that's why. <laughs> right. So, true agile is being able to work with people. Uh, communication is, is key. It's not just you talking to the client, but it's also working with collaborators. Like also in doing in trying different things, you also discover what you're good at and what you're bad at. Like for example, I started out, I started out as a web designer, but nowadays I, I should you should not let me do web design because my design sensibilities are from the nineties. So do not let me web, do web design. I'll just tell you use tables. <laughs> Nobody laugh. I guess it's a joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so no, uh, after a while, you, you, when, you, when you try everything, you discover what you, you are good at, you also discover what you are not so good at. And the, the, you can be able to recognize that. And sometimes okay, having a peer tell you your CSS is shit is a very good thing. <laughs> right? Or you're telling you that your Ruby code sucks, please do it this other way. Right? That's why code review is good. And also contributing and working on open source projects. Uh, you find an open source project on how many of you guys work on open source libraries? You use use open source libraries like you know um, you know what open source libraries are? How many of you do npm install, uh, gem install? Yeah, but use gem right? So gems are done by libraries that probably built by some open source people. Probably they are made free and you know, available to you, and somebody is working on it. So if you find that there's a bug in one of those tools that you're working on, look at to their GitHub account, look at the GitHub page and see whether someone has actually reported that bug. I remember one time I was working on PHP, uh, when I was working on PHP, I was using, I was using this framework called uh, CakePHP, and it, I was using a the basic of authentication, I think it was, no, it was a digest authentication uh, of, of the PHP library, of the framework, and there was some bug there that said it wasn't working. So I was like, why is it not working? I mean, frameworks shouldn't, shouldn't break like that, right? So I went and figured out, hey, wait, I dug into the code and thought, wait, there's actually a real bug there. That the particular, somebody who wrote that piece of code forgot to use, uh, if, uh, forgot to take the common email, email field or something like that. So I'm like, okay, you know, what can I do? I either fix it myself and just be happy and go along my merry way, or I can just submit a pull request. Which I did. I went to their website. Look, there's a bug here. Have you guys noticed this? Uh, here's my code changes that could help you fix that. Uh, after a week or two, somebody reviewed it and said, "Yeah, it looks good. We'll accept it." And um, I have, I'm proud to say, I have a commit somewhere in the in open source library, which is a very cool, cool thing. And sometimes employers also look at code for that. I know that we are we're now debating and looking for uh, developers in Singapore Power. We're looking at Rubyists or Golang people, and even iOS and Android people. And one thing that stands out in resume is your contribution to open source libraries. We look at somebody who is very active in working on or committing not just documentation, pull requests, and it's too easy to do, but if you found a real bug there, you, you suggest a fix, and you, and you have code that's committed into the main branch. That's, Something we look out for. We, like, we have done something, we have contributed somehow to some, some conversations about how to make code better, uh, or in open source libraries better. I think that's, that's something we look out for. Uh, even I myself, when I first interviewed a, when I was first looking for a developer for my company I was working for, um, one thing that stood out for me was uh, what do you do in your own free time? That's a question I ask. What do you do in your own free time? Right. What you what uh, activities or what other coding activities do you do outside of, of your work time or your study time? And the candidate that I interviewed, he was working on some uh, open source thing based on some other, another open source project. He's working on some way of uh, there was chat related stuff, online chat and forum related stuff. And that was that intrigued me that this kid could. Uh, he was younger than me, he was already working on stuff which can contribute back you know, to society and to the open source community. Uh, for me, I was out and I wanted to hire that kid and eventually, you know, he, he's quite good. Uh. He's, still, he's still running around, so yeah. Well, actually on the topic of um, doing things that you're good at, like you mentioned, and uh, Kelly mentioned about mastery of a certain framework. So for aspiring developers, um, you know, which kind of, what kind of framework or even language should they be, you know, looking at if, you, um, if they are new to programming? That's a tricky question, actually. It, it, 
bring the language to our. Um, but irrespective of uh, you know, uh, you know what what language you have learned, uh, I, I normally advise you know just uh, try out maybe a language and see whether you're comfortable with it. Um, so if you have started with Ruby or you have started with Swift, um, are you comfortable with it? Um, and if you are not, then probably you should look into something else that uh, you feel comfortable. Um, for example, like iOS recently has a uh, Swift, uh, but earlier it was like Objective C, and Objective C is definitely not a language that you should start uh, your career with. It. It's not a not a uh, preferred first language. I would say uh, the, the syntax is very different, and it, it needs some time to get used to it. Um, so th there's the first thing that if you are really familiar with uh, the syntax, you love coding uh, in the language. For example, I still find that like, Ruby so much fun. And, um, it's just uh, like English. Uh, and uh, so it depends. Like, uh, if you really enjoy building mobile apps, if you really uh, you know, uh, enjoy coding in that language, then you should just stick to that language and learn more about it. But if you somehow don't really understand some of the basic concepts of the language and you still find it really very difficult, I would say, you know, just for you ask some mentor for some experienced developers, they will try to help you out, but if you still don't get it, but then um, I think you should try and see some other languages that uh, you, should, you can uh, feel comfortable with. All right, so I think it's probably advisable, as Stu was uh, talking about, to start with a, what we can call a developer productivity language, which is something like Ruby or Python that are designed with a specific intent of letting you accomplish a lot with uh, a lot less work than some languages that are meant for embedded or systems programming like C++. Uh, and I would also like to reiterate that I think almost the mo most important thing is that you really enjoy uh, the language as well, because it's going to reinforce the, the, the learning by wanting you to spend more time on it. So I'm going to say Ruby on this. I think I consider myself a real polyglot. I know a number of languages, I know PHP, I know Ruby, I know Objective C, I know a little bit of Swift, and I know JavaScript, I know Golang, I've written some stuff in Python before. So now it still amazes me how fast I can pick up some pick up language. Like when I was working on a project in uh, I was working on a project uh, at, at work and it was written in Python. Uh, the framework they used was Django. For me it was I, w I was pairing with somebody, I was like uh, sitting with somebody and looking at the code. After maybe a week, I was asked to work on a very tricky library, or rather adding a, a big feature into, the, into that framework uh, for, the, for the client project we were working on. Uh, I was looking on my own, I was like, looking at it, shit, this is not going to be easy. Man. Um, but I got it done by looking at sample codes, looking at how people write those codes, and basically asking questions. Asking the right questions online, finding out how things are done. I think it all boils down to understanding fundamentals. Understanding what 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 con, what a con programming language consists of. Programming language consists of how you represent data, for example. How do you how do you have flow control? How do you have artificial intelligence, like if and else statements? How do you do loops? Uh, data structures like. Strings. Well, str how do you declare a string in a particular language? How do you declare a number? Or what kind of, what kind of numbers you can rep that are represented in a language? Like what's an integer? What's a float? Right? Uh, how do you represent a true, a true or false? A boolean? Right? Understanding these basic fundamentals helps you in asking the right questions and asking of the language. So how does Golang represent a boolean? A true or false, right? To use true or false, right? In 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 the objective C, it was yes and no, <laughs> and and, um, and once you know these fundamentals, how do you how do you define a variable? How do you uh, 
change the flow of the of, of, of the code. How do you represent uh, an object in a code? Uh, Object-oriented programming concepts will come in. Uh, how do you structure? So once you understand these fundamentals, going into, you, you will not have any problem learning any language in a very short time. Um, how do you do that? I think you, do, you have to first group yourself in one language. Right, learn the fundamentals of what, not just a framework. You, you, I mean, frameworks makes makes you lazy, right? You use a framework like Ruby on Rails or Django. It makes you lazy. It makes you productive, yes, but it makes you very lazy, right? For for example, um, when I first started programming, I was I was writing PHP code raw. I was like writing PHP code on my own. There was no framework, no nothing. I built a framework without knowing what the, what the meaning of the word framework. I built an MPC framework without knowing it was all. Oh, this, this, this is quite MPC. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to separate the HTML from the from the PHP code. And I didn't know there was a terminology for that. Because no computer science, right? See? <laughs> so um, things come to you intuitively when you when you start learning, okay, just group yourself in one language. I'm biased by saying PHP because you know PHP is cool, easy to use. Uh, it gets you, you really want to do a web application. Uh, PHP is very easy to pick up. Uh, Golang, maybe, but it's a bit of a different monster. <laughs> don't, go, don't choose Golang as your first language unless you're uh, somebody like Audrey. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, yeah, so, root yourself in one language. Once you, you, you nail the fundamentals of a language, uh, learning other languages is fairly easy. For me, the biggest challenge when I first picked up Objective C, uh, for example, was the uh, concept of memory management. Working for many years in PHP, I have no concept of oh, what you mean? You uh, basically now you crash the app, <laughs> right? Now, one exception was totally nothing that I never knew what was that, right? Or I, I forgot to deallocate something. Oh, crashes! Like what? Um, that was the biggest challenge for me, but nowadays with Swift, you don't have to worry so much about that. With ARC, with Objective-C, you don't have to worry about memory management anymore, which makes it a lot easier for you to actually pick up any language nowadays. The differences between the languages have... have I don't see much difference in all the languages now. If I use a language like Python or Ruby or PHP, all of them has a, con has a concept of object-oriented programming, right? Uh, Swift as well as object-oriented programming. So understand concepts, understand fundamental concepts about of, of computer science. Not really, maybe not computer science, the big concept, but conceptually how you relate uh, for what commonalities between one language to another. And the way you do that is get yourself rooted first in one language, maybe Java or JavaScript. You know these two are two different things, right? Yeah, so get yourself rooted in one language before you learn other languages. And frameworks, Frameworks, we will appreciate frameworks more once you start using it. So like, you will start, you do start with just plain vanilla PHP or Java, JavaScript. Uh, once you learn about frameworks, you're like, wow, I didn't know you could actually do this so easily. Uh, which makes you look like a Swaku person, uh, but you know, but, but for me it was um, quite interesting. Uh. So once I learned that there's such a thing called frameworks, it makes you, it makes your job. Because you, you come to a point where you've gotten enough of a rootedness in the language, and when you want to start getting productive, is when you want to start making money and earning, earning a living. And that, for that, your time becomes your money. Right? You're converting time to money, so being productive is important at that point in time. Okay? Okay, thank you. Um, so the next big topic, the question, um, what is the current demand for iOS and web developers out there, especially you know, Ruby on Rails? Um, so, in, 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 especially in Singapore and of course in global context, could you, you know, share some light on this? Yeah. I'll let uh, David answer for Ruby and Rails, I'll uh, answer for iOS. Um, actually, for mobile development, uh, there are a lot of uh, requirements, uh, both in Singapore and um, globally, uh, and uh, especially for iOS. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, because the app ecosystem is like that, um, um, there are a lot of Android apps available there. Um, but um, users of Android apps, they usually don't uh, pay money to buy these apps. 
um, so it's like mo mo most of the time uh, it's free. Um, there is uh, no review process by uh, from the Google Play Store uh, to get an app. So uh, there are a lot of apps there, but then when it comes to building apps for enterprises or startups, usually they prefer their first app to be iOS. So you can look into any um, startup in recent history when Instagram first came up with the iOS app. Um, and then there are so many such startups that just have an iOS app um, initially. And once they grow big, they, they think about an Android app. Unless their target user is uh, target users are based in India or China, where there a lot of Android devices and then they want to target uh, this specific uh, segment of users and then they get an Android. So, uh, having said that, the demand is uh, quite a lot. Um, I would say there are people locally. Um, in, in Singapore, who are looking for developers, um, most of the times they look for people having at least a couple of apps or at least one app on App Store. If you don't have any um, apps on um, App Store and you have, um, they, they look for experienced developers to be honest. And, um, but if you are just starting with this course, um, your experience is basically whatever app you build it from the App Store, right? And if you don't have that, then uh, you probably need to start uh, working at the interns or start working in a small team. Have this first app out. You know, have something to put in your portfolio that, you know, hey, I have built this app, I made so and so framework, this is how I did it, and this is how I built it. Um, so, um, I said that, uh, like, for example, Grab recently, um, they, they were looking for like 15, 16 uh, iOS developers uh, to join their team. Uh, although they have a different um, kind of selection process, uh, but then similarly, there are a lot of startups also looking uh, for mobile developers to uh, join their page, and uh, they are not finding uh, developers. Uh, like uh, Facebook is looking for uh, developers, uh, and if you know about this uh, platform called Hired, um, so you can just go and create your profile on Hired.com, and then you can choose and pick uh, which company you want to join. Um, so. Uh, Again, I'll come back to my initial statement that the demand for mobile developers and iOS developers is quite high um, at this time at least. So. Thank you. Right, so the, the demand for Ruby on Rails programmers is uh, locally high and in Singapore, Ruby has a strong foothold as well, so there's a shortage of Ruby on Rails programmers, uh, which is also true for some other Southeast Asian countries like uh, uh, Vietnam and Taiwan, and, and obviously in Japan, uh, since uh, Matt's the creator of Ruby is Japanese, uh, they're always looking for a lot of Ruby developers as well. Um, so yeah, so the demand is, is really high right now. You're a <laughs> I think companies are all, all okay. They, 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 are, they are two kind of domains that you, you, you want to work on now either web applications or mobile applications. These, two, these are two areas where startups and companies are actually building up uh, a lot of needs, needs or help with. There's another area which is uh, more on the back end, so that like say that is we call DevOps. So basically, they develop more operations. So whatever you need to do, like on the server side, these are also areas which uh, are in their demand. The people looking, we're looking for people who can who know how to manage servers, deals with stuff. So what maybe you guys are learning are mostly front end stuff that users can relate to, web applications and mobile applications. But behind all this, there's a whole bunch of other things that happen before your application gets deployed into production, right? So this the the DevOps is another area where a lot of people are in it as well. Um, especially if you've got the type who wants to work with people. <laughs> you're more comfortable talking to a computer uh, or interacting with a machine. Um, that's an area which you might also get into. Is there any specific requirements via DevOps? Being able to use uh, Linux commands, you know, you need to, uh, 
uh, learn all the basic Linux commands, how do you, how do you administer a Linux server, um, uh, Docker, we learn all the new, latest technologies like Docker, uh, Ansible, uh, Puppet, Chef. These are probably the words that are foreign to you right now, but these are all like, um, we call them, okay, well, Ansible and Chef and Puppet, these are what they call configuration management. So they use that to manage the configuration of your, on the machines that run your applications, right? So, um, and Docker is another way of, of actually deploying your applications. So it's not just uh, as a giant machine or virtual machine, but it's a small little uh, uh, server that only runs one process, which is your application. Um, think of it like Heroku, when you do Heroku uh, push, you basically you deploy a, a small server, a small server, a mini server, so it's a, basically a Docker container, it could be. So, um, think about what you're really good at, what you really, what really attracts you to, either the front end, um, you like working with web, web technologies, go with uh, JavaScript, go with some uh, front end stuff like CSS or SAS or LESS or whatever, uh, learn about new technologies there. Uh, you're really into mobile apps, then think about what you want to do, uh, either as iOS or Android. If you're doing iOS, I recommend learning Swift. If you're doing, if you want to do some Android, learn Java. There's another language that you use to write Java, Java code, which is Kotlin. You should also check that out, because it's quite a cool, cool language to try. You want to try something that is a bit mix of JavaScript with mobile development, is you can check out React Native, which is another framework that helps you. You run JavaScript, it compiles into uh, a mobile application for iOS and Android. So it's kind, of, it's kind of a cool framework to check out. So these are new technologies. So you, the other way to check is to, the other way to look at this is to look at job sites. Which are the sites, which are the jobs that pays the most? That's another way to look at it. Right? You think, I, but then again, don't, be, don't, don't let it be your only uh, criteria. Because chances are, uh, if it pays you a lot of money, it means they are a bit more demanding, which means you have to be pretty good at it. And do the other people that it means you really have to spend a lot of hours learning about it. Right? So this um, think about which domain you want to get into, front end, back end, or um, you really like to work with data, they go into data science or data uh, machine learning or data, you know, data science and machine learning. These are different areas which are in hot demand right now. Um, they are quite hot in the sense that a lot of job offers out there. Um, then again, it all comes down to what you think you are comfortable with. And also sometimes, don't let comfort be a criteria. If, you're, if you get too comfortable, sometimes when you get uncomfortable with a language, it means you're on to something. Which means that you're on to something. If it's so easy, everyone can do it. But if it's hard, it becomes uncomfortable, you know that not everyone can do this. If anybody can master this, that will be your um, your, 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 your trump card. Basically what, your, what you can be good at, right? What you can be known for. If you think it's uncomfortable, you might want to something, just keep driving at it. Um, and some chances are if it's difficult, it means there are very few people who don't how to do that well, and chances are you can probably get paid a bit more doing that. Okay, we'll hold the topic on our salary later, but maybe, you know, Michael, you could describe about a day in the life and um, in SP. So recently there's this article about the reunion of uh, Avengers, right? With South Shore as the Nick Fury. So, uh, on a side note, which superhero would you actually represent? I'm actually very curious. Uh, I don't know. What, purple, the purple polygon? <laughs> 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 no, I don't know. Okay, so, um, yeah, a day alive as a developer in SP. You actually showed us a new office of a level 8, right? Is it, is it ready already? Uh, it's somewhat ready. Somewhat ready? Yeah. Okay. So, um, in Singapore Power, we practice Agile. So we we have, we we, we, we believe that um, building modern applications right now, we want to have a modern way of doing things. Basically, we want to build, build an application as quickly as possible. In the past, people have, built, uh, have spent years just to build up something and to get it deployed. They call it the waterfall method. So in Singapore Power, we believe in using agile methodologies. 
uh, in order for that to happen, we, we, we basically we, we believe in quick validation of ideas and writing code that's test driven that, that can help us uh, move quickly. Right? So in our teams, early in, the, early in the morning, what we do first is a team setup. So we basically get a team together, we, we will uh, have a, a stand up, is literally a standing up thing. Everyone stands up, uh, uh, we'll gather in a circle in front of our, our project board. We look at our stories, and so we have a quick report about what everyone is working on. So in the stand up, we'll just say uh, one or two sentences what you, what you were working on yesterday, and we'll talk about what you want, want to do today. So we look at the paper, we look at our project uh, tracking system, which is called Paper Tracker. Uh, we also look at that and say who, who's working on which story and we look at a feature story or bug that we're working on. Uh, we also ask everyone, do you have any blockers? Whether you're facing any, any problem or issues that you uh, have you have with a story you're working on. And from there, uh, we figure out what the blockers are, we try to solve them as quickly as we can. Otherwise, we'll, everyone will, will scatter and start going about the day working on, on the code that they're working on. Uh, around 11.30 we have lunch because we believe in being the crowd, <laughs> getting out there and having food. Uh, you guys always have good lunch, I realize. <laughs> uh, we go where the food is good. Uh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, and then we carry on uh, going through the day. Um, sometimes in the uh, on, on our, on, we also have something called retrospective uh, and iteration planning meetings. These are all little agile ceremonies that we do. Um, but it's a, basically what iteration planning meeting is kind of like a, brief, uh, a team comes together together with our project owner, uh, product owner, and we talk about what we want to do next. Right? We talk about what we want to put, what to, uh, we plan like one week ahead, uh, what we want to work on in the next iteration, which is a, a, a next week. Uh, we think about, we prioritize story, think about what, what is we work on next. Either uh, front end story, back end story, all is all, all tracked together. And then uh, we, the product owner will have visibility of what's going on. I think very important that we communicate with the people that, that, that is kind of like paying us to do, 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 do that. And then maybe also other ones who have to approve what we worked on. Um, so iteration planning is very important for the team to get in sync in, on what's going on. Uh, occasionally, at the end of the month, we also do something called retrospective. So retrospective is basically something of it as an evaluation. We, think we come together to look at what we've done, what, we've done, what, what, what went well, what didn't go so well, and then how we can, what are things that we feel are a bit not so sure about. So basically it's a way, it's a way for us, for the team to, because you know, in the team working together in close proximity, we tend to you know, bump each other in some uh, ways, or we feel that there's some things that you are doing right or wrong. We want to have a, have a neutral, um, a neutral place to where we can voice this out. I think it's very important in any agile team because we're working very intensely on something. We may forget that actually our little habits may be affecting other people around you. Uh, like you're not writing enough tests or you know this code review, why do you keep complaining about this particular line of code and stuff like that. Stuff like that can block very badly if you don't deal with it uh, uh, as quickly as you can. Sometimes uh, it's not just about uh, conflicts, it's also about um, how you feel we can do better than what we do. Uh, what we should, we should continue doing, okay? Or we should give encouragement to our fellow developers on how 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 they've been doing so well. Uh, and, and the little things that they do that you don't know that they they may not know about, but but you notice. And having that is a very encouraging thing. And I will encourage the, any agile team to try this. Okay. Um, then, what do you love most about your job in SE? Working with, I think it's about working with people who are serious and professional. And we all, I think everyone in our team, we have hired so far, are quite um, serious about our craft. It's not just about writing code, but it's about being um, good at it. And so, so we look at it not just as a job, but we're, we're, it's like craft that we are, we are we're, it's a skill that we're making better and, and sharpening. So in a way, we work with people, we want to help make sure that everyone in the team grows. Like my team right now, we have two junior developers. And I make it. I make it a point in front of. Are you? Are you? Are you two ladies growing? Are you two uh, learning things? Like both of them are iOS developers. So I, I make it a point to ask them every time we have a retrospective. Are you learning? Are you growing? 
and I want to try to make sure I, I line up stories that will help them grow. And the way I also want to encourage our senior developers to pair program with some of these uh, junior developers so they can grow too. Right? Sometimes there's so many things we can learn from each other and it's in the team, this is the best way to learn, learning from your peers. Right. So do you have anything to add on? So what do you actually love about really investing? You are employee number one, right? Yeah, and uh, make a, a lot of the processes are uh, you know, the fun acts, uh, the fun things that we do. Um, so we, we, apart from our regular activities, uh, regular projects, we do have this thing called uh, Thursday Tech Talks. Um, so, so I think Thursday Tech Talks. Tech Talks. <laughs> okay, and anyway. Tech Talks, technology talks. Um, oh, okay. So, um, we get our lunch early and when we take turns, um, we basically volunteer to say or something um, that we love and uh, not necessarily related to single power but uh, things uh, that um, we have experienced or we have tried um, and we would love uh, about technology. It can be improved, any, any um, new thing that we came across. Um, and then we usually started this thing called Friday Hack. So it's like Friday Hack is kind of, uh, uh, doesn't end in Friday. We uh, set aside like two hours um, so to work on some apps together, um, which is different from our kind of day-to-day um, -day things that we're doing. Um, but those are all the side things. But uh, in addition to what Mikey mentioned, like, uh, the team is very new. Um, it's, uh, it's only like uh, five, six months uh, since all of us have joined. Uh, we are based uh, in a different office, uh, so the culture is also very different uh, from uh, you know, the national organization. Uh, a lot of uh, engineers have joined out of the community, out from the startup community, from the tech community in, in Singapore. Um, the way I see it, uh, it is like a startup within a big organization. We have um, Again, the things that are also introducing is also very new to Singapore Power uh, processes. Uh, uh, you know, the way we are coding, the way we are also intending to deliver projects are very, very new to operation. But that's what we love. And uh, another thing is, uh, like, I personally feel that all the guys we've got so far um, are really open to new ideas, really open to learn from each other, irrespective of their. Uh, kind of um, you know, the label for their game, uh, like uh, we don't mind telling some juniors, we don't uh, mind uh, you know, saying something to our seniors also. So there's like no um, uh, you know, difference in, in terms of like hierarchy. That I'm, should I say this thing to my boss? Or what would he feel? I know, would he you know, really feel bad? It's like we are very open to uh, open up our opinions and you know, the, the ideas that we have. And then together, I think it's just kind of a great team uh, that we have formed in the last few months. Uh, so, yeah, I enjoy it. What about Ted? Hi, Ted. 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 Hi, Ted
I shall suggest this to my boss. It's live streaming now, okay? <laughs> And if it's a Thursday, we'll have to hear Thursday, which is uh, similar to what we do in Singapore Power, where we will have uh, a junior uh, give a talk about uh, either something programming related or something completely unrelated. So, so we're actually having Tinker Thursday today, or my colleagues are. And um, one of our interns is giving a workshop on urban escape tactics, which is like how to get loose from being tied up with safe ties and stuff. Right. Okay, how to regain your sanity, basically? More or less. Okay. Alright, so what do you love most about your job? I think uh, what I love most about working in Thinkbox is the extreme amount of uh, autonomy that we get as <coughs> developers. So uh, we're all together in charge of constantly improving the way uh, we do things and we have a lot of room to experiment and try out new things. So I think uh, the thing that has driven me from previous jobs is the sense of getting stuck in terms of improvement. I, uh, I've tried all the, all the avenues to try to improve something that's, that's not working but, uh, without uh, having, any, having any effect. Whereas in the box, I am in church and allowed to actually fix problems as they come. Thanks, Ted. Okay, so on to the second part. Okay, um, so this question is for Ted again. Um, so you were for the box. So how do you actually manage times from hell? Uh, all right, all right. So I, I like to call <laughs> it uh, less sophisticated times. Oh, less sophisticated times. Yes. Thank you. So I think it's important to um, just to be clear, if, if you have a client that is uh, abusive, uh, then you should uh, tell your boss about it. And if you are a boss, you need to make it clear to the client that being respectful to other people is more important than any business concern. And especially as a boss, if you don't stand up for your developers in this case, you're going to lose them pretty frequently. Uh, but if you have a client that is just hard to work with, I think it's important first to understand why or what is it that makes the client hard to work with? I, in my experience, there it's usually uh, two dimensional. So uh, one is the technical sophistication. Uh, is, uh, is the client clueless about uh, everything that has to do with technology? Uh, so communication and managing expectations. Yes, uh, but it can also be problematic if they are uh, too tech savvy because they they get might get tempted to get involved in how we actually uh, do our work as well. Uh, and on the other dimension you have the, uh, the involvement. Some clients uh, tend to be too involved and micromanage, uh, which slows everything down. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have the client that uh, hands over the requirements and then they expect to come back in six months and just get everything done. Uh, so what I normally do, I will profile the client, that sounds crazy, but I will profile the client uh, initially and I will adjust my, my communication uh, according to what is needed. If the client is too hands-on, I might need to, to protect the team. Uh, if they are more or less absent, I might need to, uh, to be more proactive in, in gathering requirements from the, the client. Um, I think the most important thing with clients is to communicate to them in a way that they understand. So uh, I will normally leave out all technical details. Uh, if we run into a problem, I will uh, tell them what the problem is and what it means to them in terms of their business. And normally I will have um, two or three options prepared for how we can solve the problem and how those uh, uh, different uh, solutions relate to their business and uh, in terms of effort, how long time would it take? Uh, because I think if you if you come to the client and you have already done your homework and you suggest the solution that is best for, for their business, then um, that will get you a lot of Okay, thank you. Now, what about managing fellow teammates slash developers um, from help or unsophisticated teammates? <laughs> Right, so luckily I, I have not had any uh, colleagues from hell, I guess. Um, but 
developers can get very opinionated. Right. And a lot of the times, uh, we need to take a step back because these, these clashes oftentimes happen because of uh, underlying dogmas. So for example, we, we shouldn't allow ourselves or our colleagues to be lazy in, in code reviews and feedback and say things like, uh, I think X or I feel X. Um, we should actually uh, also clarify what, why am I actually, why don't I think this is a, a good solution? And sometimes there might be two equally good cases uh, proposed by two different programmers. And in those cases, I think we just need to take a step back, ask ourselves what is the out outcome that we're looking for. Uh, usually one of the ideas will, will seem better in that light. Uh, I've not been in any case where, where we couldn't agree. Maybe we can go into the parking lot and fight it out. <laughs> what about Michael? Do you have similar experience to share? Um, so I have been, right now I'm involved in the recruitment process at, at Singapore Power and uh, previously in my job at, uh, at Pivotal Labs, uh, so we also had some small role to play because everyone uh, looks into, everyone, everyone gets a chance to, to review uh, people who are joining us. Um, we believe very, very it's very important to hire right and take our time to hire people. Uh, in a sense, we, we know that when we, we take our time to hire somebody from, to have a proper process of hiring somebody, it helps us reduce the problems that we get when, we, when the person starts. Uh, as in, we reduce the risk of having to hire somebody which we feel that will to be a good fit. Um, I think Having many people look at persons, okay, so uh, looking at a person's resume is nice, uh, but we also want to make sure that a person really knows what, he's, what he says he knows. Um, we also feel very, very, yeah, we also very, feel very strongly that we have to make sure we have a process in place to hire somebody uh, and to be able to um, select people which you feel, even though you can say it could be like a self. Propagating some culture, but it's very important to hire the right people that is that can fit the culture of the company. Um, that would reduce the risk of having problematic colleagues. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, what about money matters? Like, how much do local companies actually pay? Um, for instance, the juniors or the best starting point. And what about the career progression track? Maybe so can give us. So is it like how much uh, the local companies pay to agencies to hire or how much they pay to the developers uh, salary, right? Yeah. Um, well, it, it depends from organization to organization. Uh, but if I just put a number, right, I have to put a number, I think um, if you are really junior first or college, you have uh, some experience, but you're joining a junior level or just say, um, you know, um, first grad. Uh, 3K is, is kind of uh, an average, uh, but again, it depends uh, on organization to organization. Sometimes uh, a startup might, you know, pay you really high because you have done six months intensive there and they are really aware of your skills and then we have shown some importance to you know build some great projects <coughs> um, and also it kind of sometimes depends on um, the, the technology also um, uh, I won't get into that into details but um, I mean 3k is what I would say is kind of an average so for, for yeah. startups um, it's, it's oh, kind of an average for uh, for large costs also but then uh, Sometimes you know some uh, some really good established product companies would be like four K uh, to you know first grads. Uh, but again, um, if you have uh, sometimes it matters to have a formal degree because then you get uh, uh, you know you come to the university and the university sends you to 
these companies and then they have sometimes uh, prior uh, kind of establishments and then you check with your previous colleagues and uh, it also depends on how well you can negotiate with the HR for your first job. Uh, it's like uh, as a junior developer, if you get your first job, you're happy about the job and you go free to negotiate your salary, then you're, uh, that's what you get for whatever the agent offers you. But then if you really know that you are going to value add for the team and then you have the skill set um, uh, where you can contribute for the team that you can try to make it uh, something that is uh, more important to you. What about antinomals? Right, so, so I don't uh, know the exact numbers either for the, the, the salaries, but I can talk you about the career paths. Uh, this is um, a challenge, I think, in the tech industry in general that it's historically has been very hard to make a career horizontally. If you want to be an expert developer, then you sort of get stuck at the senior developer tier. Um, there are some companies that are, that are acknowledging this and are actively trying to change it. So you have companies like Travis C5, so they have uh, actually split their um, engineering career path into 18 distinct levels so that you can continue to progress as, a, as an expert. Because doing uh, engineering management or project management, uh, which are the, the more old school uh, career paths, is very different from being a programmer. And I don't think it's something that everyone would enjoy doing. If you're already enjoying doing programming a lot, then um, try to find a company that can, that can accommodate your, your growth as an expert. Um, I think don't be too so confused. Or don't be so obsessed with getting a high salary. Don't be so obsessed, but more, be more obsessed with learning and finding out um, the teams they can work with to help you get better at what you do. Um, Having said that, don't sell yourself short, right? If you know that you are good at something, as I say, you found some really troublesome thing that you found yourself mastering, you know that they probably you, you know that you can be worth more than some people. So the startups probably have a, can be quite working as well can be quite interesting. In a sense, you can do a lot of things. You get opportunity to try a lot of different things. Um, and they may not actually pay you a lot, but the opportunity to learn so, uh, learn to do things, uh, learn how to manage servers, how to do all sorts of funny, funny things, which you, do, you may not actually have the chance, you wouldn't have the chance to do in a larger company. So if you join a larger company, you probably be siloed or pigeonholed into doing one particular aspect. Of the business, unless you request to join the other team, other team to try different things. So, chances of you enhancing your skills in other areas beyond what you are uh, you join the company for may be a bit lower if you join a big company. Whereas, if you join a, a startup, the chances of you learning more things and trying different things and being just being, being an all rounder. I think that in startups, you do get. Um, so the second job that I, the first job I joined was basically uh, first startup that I joined. Uh, I didn't get very high pay, um, but it gave me opportunity to, to be the only uh, backend developer on the team working on backend stuff. So when I joined my second company, I was able to use that uh, resume in my resume and say, "Look, I've done all this, all this shit. I've done all this uh, backend stuff, and I've done some iOS stuff as well." You know, if you need to have a person work on some iOS related stuff, I can help you with that. Uh, I've done, also I've done extra, extra things on my own. I've tried some benchmarking of, of different types of servers, like how does an Apache server compare to an Nginx server in terms of load testing and all that shit. So, stuff that you wouldn't probably have time to do, um, um, stuff that you should have, uh, you should get experience, you, you will get experience doing in a startup. Um, and then you can use that in your next resume. You may not start out with a high pay, 
but because of the learning opportunities you can get, okay, it will help you build up your resume for the subsequent jobs you go for. I can categorically say that I doubled my salary in four years, just because I was able to show growth, personal growth in many, many areas.
right? So, so in Tecnobox, we offer paid internships, and they are open uh, all year round. So, uh, depending how saturated you are on interns at the moment, you can always uh, drop an application through our website. Uh, and for interns, our expectations are not, are not that high, so as long as you can uh, show us something that you built, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, we'll probably invite you for, um, for a quick interview and a small technical test. And if uh, all is good after that, you're welcome to join us as a paid intern for uh, three months initially. And we currently have two previous interns who are now working with us as full-timers, as junior developers. Uh, and of course, we're also hiring junior developers if, uh, if you're the right person, and we're always hiring. Uh, so our expectations on juniors in the company is that you can complete a simpler client project uh, on your own with uh, uh, Tinkerbox quality standards applied without causing a uh, a huge mess, then uh, you qualify as a junior. And you can easily show this by building a, a well polished project on your own, and uh, if you're savvy, even add some, uh, uh, some tests to it. And that will uh, definitely put you ahead of the, of the game when you send in your application to us. Alright, um, so any parting words? This is the last question. Any advice? The students and buying developers? I mean, I, I guess it's the same thing. Uh, just by learning a lot of new technology or tools and all will really help you. Um, it's the first start, it's the first step. But the next thing is to uh, how to build um, something real, how to build a bullet that people will use, or uh, at least can you build, it, build an app or a website or a you know, tool that you personally will use uh, and then get it done to you, whether by yourself or through uh, you know working with your uh, teammates from the school or you know friends and just get something out there and then uh, put it online put it on app store and then um, make yourself visible and uh, from there you can have, get feedback from your mentors get feedback from um, the established developers in the community. Um, they will give you a lot of opportunities. They will give you a lot of exposure. I think my, my final advice would be to really en enjoy what you're doing. Because enjoying it will uh, incentivize you to do it more, which will make it better, which will make it more enjoyable. And yeah, also, uh, if you're interested, immerse yourselves in the local meetups. So you have the IRS meetups, you have the PHP meetups, and the Ruby meetups. Uh, isn't it the worst thing that can happen is you go there and get free dinner, so it's, it's not all that bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, the, the meetups have free pizza, so it, it, yeah, you yeah, save some money. <laughs> um, I think for, for you guys who, how many of you guys are actually students uh, in, in this batch? One, two, three. Cool. So my advice to you is don't stop learning. Your learning continues. Keep learning new things. Um, because what you've learned here, you don't, you know it's a lot of things you've learned in the last few weeks or months. It's not enough. It's really not enough. It just uh, gives you a taste of what is out there. If this is, you really want, you after going through all this and you feel that it's the career you want to get into, don't stop learning. People that we have hired uh, at Single Power, who have come through programs like this, uh, is we don't. We did okay in my previous job at Pivotal Labs. We interviewed lots of people that come straight fresh out of a program like this, and all of them failed their first interview because the fundamentals are just not there. They don't have a good foundation in, 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 in programming that we can group that we can group them. It's not easy to find to have that in a very crash course scenario like this. It's not easy to get it. You can get it, awesome. But you, you, but it's I would say is you know, it's a lot of things you have you know, to absorb in a very short time. Take your time now to 
we revisit what we've learned and continue learning. Um, go, go for other causes outside of this. Uh, go for those people who have hired a single power, who have gone through a program like this, we've seen their ability to continue learning. Uh, one lady who has gone through this uh, first uh, as a web developer, and after a while, she decided to change and learn Swift instead. Uh, and we have seen the capacity to, to pick up uh, knowledge very quickly. And from there, we can tell that this is probably somebody that has potential to grow and to be better at this. So it's showing us that we all have the ability to learn, to grow, to continue learning, and be fast at it. Because I think you will join a startup or company that is like a startup. Um, you really have no time to slowly groom you. Of course, they will have a mentor to help you, but no, it's, it's a luxury that not many companies have. You can join a company like Pivotal Labs, they will groom you, but maybe not now. Get, get some time, spend half a year learning other things, getting better. Watch, so you just revisit what you learned in the last few months. Look at it and say, what are the things that really, that really, that really draws you in? Get into those. Or things that makes you uncomfortable, get comfortable with those things. Once you've learned all that, learn, go keep learning, just keep learning. Um, and that will show in, in, in your code, the quality of your code, get peer reviews. You, your friends here continue to interact with each other, uh, look at each other's code once in a while, meet up occasionally, um, talk about stuff, not, not just hee ha ha, but talk about code. What makes a good coder? What makes a good developer? What do you find uh, admirable about Sue, Ted, and myself? What do you find uh, qualities that we have that makes that that you feel you can aspire to and learn from? Um, coming to coming to meetups is a very good thing. I think uh, we then we get visibility, we can put a name to a face, right? And then we can then ask you what what have you what have you done? If I ask you what have you done, what have you done so far? What have you, what projects have you worked on? Uh, if you're interesting, you can tell me something interesting. If you're good, you can tell me something interesting. No. Sometimes it's like, what is your claim to fame? Right? What is your claim to fame? What is the thing that I can immediately know? Oh, this guy, he's done this before. It's pretty cool. So when I, usually when I, if I can't hire you, sometimes I get, I get uh, requests. Oh, I'm looking for uh, a developer. I'm looking for a junior developer for this. I'm looking for a junior developer for that. If I get those news, I know that you're good at those things. You'll be the first, you'll be on top of my list, uh, I'll probably recommend you as well. Right? But if I don't know who you are, I don't know what you've done, it's a bit hard. If you told me you work on a particular framework or you talk about a particular library, and I know that the company is looking for that kind of person, I can recommend you immediately. Right? So, yeah, get your face out there, we get, we get a bit more social with people like us, and if you want to meet people, come talk to us, and we can introduce you to people at meetups. Right. Um, so you know, this three of us are entry point, and of course we've been and and, uh, and many and Kale and uh, you know team here. Everyone of us are uh, have have context and leverage on our context because it's also in our interest that you grow. It's in our interest that the community grows uh, as as a whole because there are not many engineers out there. There are not many software developers out there, and we are still hot demand. But it's it's in this service to the community. If we recommend people who can't get the job done or give us a bad name. Right? So you, we, to join our fraternity, you have to be serious about this. Um, yeah. And of course, I hope you all wish you success. Thanks, Michael. Um, well, um, if I would summarize, basically, just never stop learning and uh, enjoy what you do. And of course, you know, immerse in the ecosystem, um, basically be visible. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much. I think um, it's been, you know, um, it's been really an inspiration to all of us. Now, um, because of a bit of time overrun, we probably have time for one or two FAQs. Do you guys have any questions um, for for them? No. Yes, Kai. Actually, I'm Kai. Actually, I'm from the product design track, uh, but I'm also very interested in engineering. Uh, just now, Michael, you mentioned uh, your, your daily routines. You talked about test-driven code. So I'm curious what, what that means. And also, 
when you do your stand-up meeting, right, uh, if someone says they have a blocker, do you really talk about how to unblock at the moment or you, you, you take it offline later on? Yeah, it's two questions. So test-driven code is basically, you write the test first before you write the code. Uh, it sounds, so test code, test, testing code is also code. Prototyping <laughs> code, you mean? Uh, if you're writing, yeah, no, maybe not really prototype, but it's more like if, you're, if your function is supposed to do something, uh, you write a test that checks whether with the correct inputs, does your function keep it correct outputs. It can also be uh, uh, integration tests. That could be like on, on the app itself, like when I tap on this button and tap on that button, I should then reach a clear screen. There could be interaction uh, feature tests, the those feature tests. Can I apply to the web application, the mobile application? The different types of tests that could be written um, for any, any code. Um, test driven code we, is something we aspire to, and we, we put, we, 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 why, we, why, why do we like test driven code? It's because if there's any changes that we need to make in code in the future, it makes things less expensive to make changes to, to code. Because you have tests you have, you have test that covers you, as in when you make a code change somewhere, to make sure that you don't bring anything else out in other, other places, what do you do? You test it manually, right? We have test driven, you have tests that actually run through the rest of your, of your code that make sure those other parts that you didn't touch are not broken by your one code change in one place. Um, it makes it less expensive to make changes to your code. And so blockers, we it depends. It depends on what kind of blockers you have, right? The short answer is depends. If it's something that you can describe in you know, one short sentence or two short sentences, um, We'll probably try to solve it as fast as we can. If it's a code, it's a code, it's a blocking, it's a blocker based on I don't know how to work this code. Let's so if it's that kind of blocker, I can sit the review and probably help you through that code and see what we can do or find somebody who knows that code better. If it's a blocker based on um, policy or some other things, then we'll try to take it offline and we we'll address that in a separate in a separate place. Like we know that this is a blocker based on something upstream. Like a, a product owner has not decided on certain decisions, we should then have a chat with that product owner and say, what, what do you mean by this? How do you mean by that? Right. So that's pretty much how we deal with blockers. Highlighting these things early is very important because then we know uh, the constant feedback back and forth and communication between the product owners and everyone in the team is important. We put on, in agile teams, we put a premium on communication and being transparent about what you think is, is going to affect productivity of team or affect how you deliver the product. Yeah. Any more questions? Any questions? Yes. Okay. Let me compliment Michael. <laughs> Mike, you see one thing, you repeatedly mentioned about mastery. Too often in Singapore you find they keep on learning and learning and not knowing what they're learning. The question in the software dimension, too often they don't go outside the box. They don't reinvent. Even OS that's around, they are just happy to, you know, likewise, you know, status quo. And keep on learning, being a follower, and never an inventor. So what kind of talent are we looking for, actually, in terms of, you know, when you can excel and yet refusing to excel, you don't want to be a champion. So what is it? The learning problem in Singapore. Thank you. Um, sometimes I because I my study history, so I can I can say that Singapore is a small country. And uh, in a small country we do have Little say in how global affairs are run. I think given even even so, um, I see a lot of engineers uh, working in international companies like Facebook, uh, Google. Uh, you find a lot of them are Singaporeans. Quite a number of Singaporeans are working in Facebook, not in Singapore but in Silicon Valley, right? So um, where the heart of all this innovation is happening. Um, I think it's important to think out of the box and the kind of mastery that could bring us to that point where we can be leaders rather than followers. 
I'm not sure we have, I, I, I don't think I reached a point. And I think there's something I also want to aspire to and learn to get better at being a top leader. Because I'm so comfortable with being a, a follower, as you say. Um, being a master, a master of one thing that I'm really comfortable with. I think I should speak my own advice and get out of my comfort zone. Uh, I think to learn stuff that can keep me keeps me uncomfortable. Um, being a top leader, I don't know. I don't think I, I, I may not have enough knowledge to be that, but I hope we really certainly but that's when I ran the uh, PhD conference I, there was one comment made by uh, one of the one of the one of the my keynote speakers and said, hey Michael, you, 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 Singapore is a great place to uh, uh, run a conference. It's the first time I'm in Asia. Um, it's great. But he says that we, we, we hope to see speakers coming out of this region, uh, going to the States and speaking in, in, in the States and then speaking in those other conferences outside of Singapore and outside of Asia, which I think is slowly happening. Uh, Sayani uh, Basu recently spoke at a JavaScript conference in overseas. We have Audrey, uh, who basically spoke at uh, Go, all the Go conferences. He's not, she's not working in Silicon Valley. Awesome, awesome lady. Um, yeah, we need to build top leaders. And don't think that you have nothing to offer. I think as Julian as you can also have a lot of interesting insights to offer. I think that's something we should try and cherish. That you do not know everything. And when you discover new things, it could be something new that all together that we do not even know about. So, yeah. Any more questions? No? Um, if no, then uh, we'll end the session. But before that, thank you all three for your time today. And uh, the little token of appreciation for all of you. So, Ted, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, so the next part of the session is uh, just one-to-one -one mingling. So if you have any questions uh, for, for our speakers, please feel free to approach them, they are still here. And thank you all, can we give them a round of applause, please? Thanks, guys. Thank you.